the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Mighty God, in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As called an ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have thought on your steadfast love, O oh, oh God. In the midst of your temple, as your name, O oh God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. This is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. Long, O oh God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O oh God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above, and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant to us, Lord, the spirit to think and do always such things as are right, that we, who cannot do anything that is good without you, may be enabled by you to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. reading for the eighth Sunday after Trinity, the prophet Jeremiah, the 23rd chapter. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say no disaster shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? Behold the storm of the Lord Wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest, it will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can a man hide himself in secret places? so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies, and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, declares the Lord, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. This is the word of the Lord. of the body you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, 
that you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. According to St. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you'll recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is the gospel of the Lord.
joy which come only from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because he is the one who was, who is, and who is yet to come. The text for today's sermon, Matthew chapter 7 verse 15. Beware of false prophets. If there's no such thing as absolute truth, then there can't be a false prophet. No truth, no way to become a false prophet. But we know that there is absolute truth, and so Christ speaks the warning. Beware of false prophets. The problem is most false prophets don't realize that that's what they are. They believe what they believe, and if you've never had the truth, then you can't lose it. Thus, Christ's warning isn't for those who are outside the faith. When he says, beware of false prophets, he's speaking to us. He's speaking to his church. Now, the world, at least in some ways, is kind of a blank canvas. It knows nothing of God, of truth, of life, or, or what makes for peace with God. The world knows only what it wants. So, if the worldly decide on a God, he has to conform to what their idea of God should be. That's why they inherently deny the true God and make idols in the image of what it is that they want. The human heart wants what it wants because the human heart is filled with sin. That's why in the world, true and false are an ever-changing thing. What's true out there today may not be true tomorrow. What today is false may tomorrow be true. The world flits from truth to truth to truth, yearning for the next best thing like a techie panning after the newest gadget that they can buy. St. Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Unbelief is always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So you see, Christ is definitely not talking to the worldly when he says, beware of false prophets. He's talking to the church. And by the way, not just to the leaders of the church, those that we like to call the clergy, Christ is speaking to all the faithful, to every single Christian, to you, when he says, beware of false prophets. Now, False prophets who use the Bible as their kind of uh, way of getting where they want to go, their framework for their false teaching, they often ignore a basic truth. God's Word is not a series of one-liners. For instance, out of context, Genesis 41, Joseph served in Pharaoh's court. What does it prove? They played tennis in the Old Testament. Right? Of course not. God's word must always be read in context. When Christ says, beware of false prophets, it's part of this whole sermon that he preached to a crowd of people. He wasn't giving instructions to a select few, to an elite group of men, those whom we would, for instance, rely on for uh, teaching us in the church. He was speaking to the whole church, to every man, woman, and child baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now it's true, God has established an office in the church for teaching His Holy Word. We usually call it the pastoral office. Those in this work are to preach the gospel, to administer the sacraments, to faithfully teach the whole counsel of God, and then to watch over the flock that has been committed to their personal care. But a pastor can do only what a pastor has been given by God to do. He cannot think, he cannot believe for you, he can't get inside your head and, and turn your thoughts from lies to the truth of God. The one most responsible for your spiritual care so that you receive the truth and you're protected from lies that would destroy your faith, the one most responsible for that is you. It's to you that the individual, Christ, the individual Christian that Christ says, beware of false prophets. But why? Why are we to beware of them? Well, the fact is, it's because they can kill you. But how can they kill you? The prophets, what do they do? They talk, they say stuff. And you know the saying, 
Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. You know the saying, but my friends, it is absolutely not true. Not only can words hurt you, they can kill you. Since God's word is the way in which he creates faith, the falsifying of his words becomes Satan's way of destruction of the faith. It's the historical record from the creation. God's word of truth brings life. Satan's lies bring death. So truly, God's word is the Holy Spirit's camel through the desert. It is by the word that he brings life to the wasteland of your life. What it was before the Lord and giver of life converted you. Today from Romans 8. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of the adoption of sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So, how are you led by the Spirit of God? How does he bear witness with your spirit that you are God's child? Well, he does it by speaking the absolute truth to your heart. John chapter 6. Jesus, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. If you are a Christian, then you are the good shepherd's lamb. He has spoken to you the words that have given you life. False prophets are wolves. They speak words that bring death. So, truth matters. And that's true because life that God has given matters. Christians must beware of false prophets for the sake of their eternal life in heaven. Of course, here's the problem. False prophets... <laughs> They don't go around advertising themselves as, as false prophets. They, they certainly won't look like wolves, because then what would happen? Your guard would just naturally be raised. Instead, false prophets look like you and me. And this means false prophets and teachers whose teachings will seek to destroy the faithful, faith of the faithful, they don't present themselves as these suspicious characters that are lurking around. They portray themselves as insiders, as defenders of the truth against error. In other words, false prophets never appear as wolves, but like just a part of the flock. And that, my friends, is exactly the secret of their success. Why would you need protection from another sheep? Why would you need to drive another fellow sheep away from the flock? So you see, if the wolf convinces most of the sheep that he's just one of them, then when a member of the flock who's paying attention to what's being said calls out the pretender in their midst, it can often be the whistleblower and not the wolf that will be doubted. So often that is the way that it is in the church today. That's why you must return again and again to Christ's warning. Nothing, nothing is more precious than the truth. Popularity, power, financial success, personal health and well-being, none of it is as important as God's truth. Because it is the truth that rescues you from sin. It's the truth that makes you free. It's the truth that leads you to heaven. It's the truth that shows you how God loves you. The truth guides you through life and takes you to the gateway, the continuing path that leads to everlasting life. Truth isn't academic. Truth isn't just the concern of philosophers and professional theologians. Truth is your daily bread of life. So since the pure teaching of God's word is a necessity, since it's the Christian's right to have God's word purely, it is your solemn duty, it is your solemn duty as a believer in Christ's absolute truth to judge the doctrine that you hear. Listen to Luther. To recognize and judge doctrine behooves each and every Christian so much 
that he is accursed who infringes upon this right by as little as a hair's breadth. For Christ himself has established this right by various and unassailable statements, such as Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing. Christ is talking to you who are in the pew, and he commands you that you condemn false teaching. But how can you condemn it if you don't have the right to judge between truth and falsehood? <laughs> Thanks be to God. It is your divine right. Christ hasn't just given you the right. He has given you the command to judge the doctrine that you hear. This single statement, beware of false prophets, in the proper context of the whole of the scripture, gives you in the pew not just a right, but the responsibility to monitor and, if necessary, condemn all false teachers, no matter how high their stature no matter how ancient their teaching, no matter how outwardly authoritative that they appear. You must protect yourself, and even more, you must protect those who may be so dull or lazy that they fail to protect themselves. Here stands Christ saying to you, beware of false prophets. They'll, they'll constantly attack the faith of the faithful. Like, like even as wildly popular as they are, Joel Osteen and, and Joyce Meyer, they so falsely portray God, but their sound bites seem so sweet. And then when they gain your confidence, they suck you into their clever, clever denials, the denials of the Holy Trinity, or that Christ Jesus is in fact the only Savior, or that the Holy Spirit is truly God. You hear the sound bites, you read the one-liners, and you can be seduced into their books. There, there to be murdered by the falsehoods that pull you from the true and living Christ. False prophets like to distort God's law. Deny what he says is right and wrong is right and wrong. Smoothly, and with this powerful drumbeat of repetition, 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 convince the weak that God's standards of morality have to be adapted. They have to be adapted to fit the modern times. These prophets also, they like to confuse people about Christ. Instead of teaching, as God's word clearly does, that sin is forgiven and we're made right with God freely for Christ's sake alone, that he obeyed for us, that his death made complete satisfaction for our sin, that we receive his forgiveness through faith alone, they teach, if you want any of God's forgiveness, if you want any of his help, if you want help with your troubles, then you must follow their rules and do the works that they command you to do. That makes Christ no longer a savior. He just becomes this presiding judge. And I hope all of you know very well it's an unbearable burden to try and always be good and never sin. Thank God in Christ. You've been given faith to believe Christ has forgiven you completely with his holy blood. False prophets also tend to speak wrongly about Christ's sacraments. Instead of teaching, as God's word clearly does, that they convey and they seal to you Christ's forgiveness, life, and salvation, they say sacraments, well, they're only signs. They're just symbols. They don't actually give you anything when you receive them. And my friends, that robs Christians of a source for strong faith. False prophets also like to teach falsely about who God's word says that we are. They'll say sin only kind of makes you weak, but it hasn't made you helpless. They falsely try to convince people that, that they have the free will to choose good, rather than that God has chosen you in Christ Jesus. But boy howdy, do those false prophets look good. Satan works hard to make them look that way. He molds them into what our sinful flesh prefers. But Christ tells you not to go by looks. He teaches you to trust him and go by what he says. No power can overthrow the faith of a Christian who stubbornly holds 
to what Christ Jesus says. So cling to the word. Confess the true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lay claim to everything he gives because you know that you are God's child and his heir and that's why you have peace with him. Life is lived at war with false teaching. It's discouraging, I know, always to be at war. The nation knows it and we know it in our spirits. The flesh is discouraged that we're always at war. But that war will draw you ever more firmly to Christ. So judge with confidence the doctrine you hear by the perfect standard of God's Word. In the grace of that Word, you have the eternal life to which you were called at holy baptism. Now, you are forever secure by faith in Jesus' precious name. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus, amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon with all our heart, with all our mind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the Holy Christian Church, here and scattered throughout the world, for the proclamation of the gospel and the calling of all to faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer our nation, for good government, for our cities, our communities, for the common welfare of us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, for seasonable weather, for the fruitfulness of the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, for those who labor, for those whose work is difficult, and for all who travel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those in need, for the hungry and the homeless, the widowed and the orphaned, for all those in prison, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the sick, and dying, for all those who care for them, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Arvin and Athenia Michael, and all who uh, see them, as we rejoice that they have been married in Christ uh, for 50 years. May they be an example to the world by God's grace. For their guests and those who travel home, having joined them in rejoicing, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the martyrs in Iraq, 
and throughout uh, the world. That the holy angels uh, would fight and defend them. That we would see uh, their suffering. And that we would uh, join them in confessing Christ Jesus, who judges the living and the dead and fights for his church through death and resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for Nathan Rutherford and for Richard Wine, that according to the Father in heaven's uh, mercy and will, uh, their suffering would be short and their recovery quick. Above all, that whoever bears infirmities might be strengthened in faith to know that whether living or dying, Christ Jesus is the Savior of all men. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, for these, for all our needs, body and soul, uh, we pray, Lord, in Christ Jesus and in his name. Amen. Welcome to all of you this morning. It is our duty and our delight to celebrate the sacrament of our Lord's body and blood. We believe, teach, and confess about this sacrament exactly what God's Word says of it. That it offers to us under the outward forms of bread and wine, the very body and the very blood of Christ, to eat and to drink. Its primary benefit, the forgiveness of sin, which we have such great need for. We believe, teach, and confess also that this sacrament is to be celebrated in the unity of the faith that we confess together before this altar. Therefore, along with the Lutheran Church and the Synod, we practice what's called close or closed or fellowship communion. If you're a member of Trinity or of another LCMS congregation, or you've spoken to Pastor Cheryl or myself about receiving the sacrament here, and you intend to do so today, please fill out the card and put a mark next to your name indicating you went to the sacrament. Hand that card to the usher when you come from the pew. If you're visiting with us today and would like to become a communicant, or you have a question, you have a need, if there's any way we can help you, we'd love to do that. Please indicate that for us on the visitor side of the card. Fill it out, lay it beside you in the pew. It'll be picked up after this divine service. <laughs>
the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glory, Allah's name, evermore praising you and singing. us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
us pray. We give thanks to Almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. bless you and keep you. The Lord may his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You like to be seated. Believe it or not, the construction is coming somewhat to a close. We thought with the general contractor this week, ask if they might hurry along a little bit, and they did comply. Uh, the progress of the week is not particularly seen because it was spent, uh, the majority of it in the kindergarten room so that they can get the kindergarten ready for uh, school. Uh, that said, if you're able-bodied and brave, uh, Miss Marshall has a carpet man coming tomorrow to replace some carpeting in the kindergarten room, so she'd be hopeful that you could help save her a dollar on carpet removal. Uh, and help take some carpet out before you go home today in the kindergarten room and move a few things out of there. Hey, get that kid out of here. I mean it. Move. I'm talking and he's squawking. Stand up and move. just like at home. <laughs> right. Hey, I can't get no respect around here. Uh. So we're prepping Miss Marshall's room for carpet, if you're willing. Uh, they're going to start then on the main bathrooms this week. They did some tear out last week. Um, so those should be completed uh, uh, by next Sunday is the hope, and the hope is that in two weeks' time now, they'll be out of the building. Now, whether or not that happens, who knows. Um, uh, in any case, we about could have Sunday school this week, and we could about have Sunday school next week, um, but we're just going to kind of have to see what stage they're in. Um, so that the Sunday school teachers aren't caught unaware, like, oh yeah, in five minutes you have to teach Sunday school. So um, probably what we do if we'll have Sunday school next week is I'll just teach it in a general way that any child to whoever might decide to listen might be edified by it so that the Sunday school teachers don't have to prepare if we indeed have it. So. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say anything else, but that seems like enough. Uh, 